Let's go back to the twin paradox. Now that we've gotten things a bit more quantitative, and in particular now that we have a definition of velocity, um, we can do a quantitative version of the twin paradox. Um, really the main part of the twin paradox is just this observation that this proper time lapse is different from the sum of these two guys. And as I've said, analogizing Euclidean geometry, that's utterly unparadoxical, not even surprising. But let's do some numbers. So suppose that um, they start out, they're each 21 years old at point at event P, okay? And then Paul, this is uh, Paul making the trip, and this is Peter. Suppose that um, Paul goes out with a relative velocity of 24 25ths of the speed of light. Pretty darn fast. Okay? And then what we what Peter notices is that he waits 50 years before Paul returns. So it's 25 years here, 25 years here. And so 25 in 25 years he knows the plan is that simultaneous to that according to Peter is when Paul is going to turn around at a distant star. Okay? Um, and then he's going to come back. And let's see if we can figure out what this length and this length are, these, these time intervals, because that's the crucial thing. Well, we know that the velocity is 24, 25th the speed of light, so this is going to be 24. So that the ratio of x over t is going to be 24, 25th. And now we just have to do a tiny little bit of geometry on this right triangle. This really is a right triangle. And this is the hypotenuse, but it's a Minkowski right triangle. Okay. And so um, the PQ, what's that going to be? It's going to be the square root of the inner product of PQ with itself. But PQ is the vector 24, comma 25. and I'm going to take that and take the inner product with itself. Okay, so that's going to be the square root of 25 squared minus 24 squared. Okay. Uh, no, 24, uh, oh, square root of the absolute value. There we go. And the absolute value switches it so we can get the right thing. And if you figure that out, that's actually 7. Now, it's interesting that 7, 24, 25 is a Pythagorean triple in ordinary Euclidean geometry. And of course it's a Pythagorean triple in Minkowski geometry as well. It's just that 25 is no longer the hypotenuse. The long side is not the hypotenuse in Minkowski geometry for this kind of triangle with a, a one time-like and one space-like side. The hypotenuse in, here, in this case is actually the shortest side. So that's 7. Symmetrically this is 7. And so Peter when they rejoin is 71 years old. He's 21 plus 50 years old. Because you wouldn't send a tiny newborn off here. That's why they were 21 years to start. They've got to be of legal age to do this legally. Um, and then Paul is only 35 years old. Much, much younger. Now, this is not something we could do, this kind of relative velocity off for this amount of time, using modern Chazay's technology. But it's, um, it's plausible in the maybe in the far future. Okay, so that's an, a nice example where we're using the notion of velocity and a little bit of coordinates and the standard coordinate formula for the Minkowski scalar product and the magnitude and this nice observation about Pythagorean triangles, uh, Pythagorean triples makes the numbers come out nicely. Now, I want to do a more complicated example that gets at some of the things that again seem paradoxical about relativity. Um, classic example, it goes back to Einstein, although I don't know if he used the numbers, of train in a station. But what I want to do first is I want to do, I want to emphasize again the geometry here. And I want to do an, a Euclidean analog of a train problem. So it's going to not really be have anything to do with trains in any obvious way. Um, but we'll see how the, uh, the Minkowski analog is going to be a train, a train passing through a station. Okay, so here's the deal. We've got two pairs of parallel lines. Here's line L. Here's line M. And here's two 
points on those lines, and they are joined by P, which is perpendicular, orthogonal to L and M. And then, so that's one pair of parallel lines and a perpendicular to, to both of them. Now here's J and K. These are parallel to each other, and they pass through those same exact points. Okay? And I'm going to label, um, let's see. Oh, yeah, and then there's going to be a perpendicular to those guys, which we'll call key, little q. And then let's label this point as c and this point as d. And I'm going to ask some, some interesting questions here. Okay. Oh, and just to make everything definite, uh, numerical, the angle is going to be um, 30 degrees. So this is, this is well, it looks a bit bigger, but that's okay. The angle there is 30 degrees. And just so I can link up with the train example, let's say the distance between A and B is 100 meters. The length of that segment is A is 100 meters. Doesn't look like it, does it? 100 meters. Okay. So here's um, two natural questions. What is the distance between lines L and M? And similarly, what is the distance between lines J and K? Now, this one, hopefully, seems really easy, and this one seems like it shouldn't be too hard, okay? Um, but I'm going to show you how, if you are really perverse, you might come up with b wrong answers to both of those questions, okay? So I'm going to use a little bit of the terminology that we use in, in relativity. I'm going to think of these two lines together as one observer. So that's the observer for whom L, M, and P are preferred. And... Um, I'm going to think of J, K, and Q as another observer, another system of describing the world. Okay, And let's just say this is John and this is Mary. John loves to use straight up and down and horizontal L, M, and P to describe the world, one coordinate system essentially. And Mary loves to use J, K, and Q. And they lo love them a little bit more than they should probably. Okay, So let's look at question number one. The distance between two lines. How are you supposed to define the distance between two lines? You take two lines and you take a perpendicular line to those and you look at the length of this segment on that perpendicular line. Okay. So one, the correct answer is the um, magnitude of AB, which I was I gave to you as 100 meters. Okay. And so since that is a distance between John's lines. John's system does turn out to work for that. Using P was the right thing to do to measure the distance between John's lines because it was orthogonal to John's lines. Okay, But um, what would be an incorrect answer? And this might seem perverse again, but it's going to be something that the mistake people usually make in relativity. That would be to th kind of perversely say, hey, maybe Mary's system is a really good way to measure this. I'm going to take the distance between these two points on John's lines. Certainly, I've got to take the distance between two, some two points on John's lines to get the distance between the L and M. But maybe I should take these two points. Well, that's just wrong. But what would you get if you did that? Okay, The magnitude of AD, okay, well, this is a 30, 60, 90 triangle. And AD is the hypotenuse of a 30, 60, 90 triangle. And the long leg is 100 meters. And so you get um, one, 200 over root 3, which is about 115.5 meters. Okay. And so Mary, if she's really wedded to measuring everything with Q, instead of doing what's really obviously the geometrically correct thing, she's going to say, oh, no, no, these lines are 115.5 meters apart from each other. And everybody's going to be pretty think that's pretty silly, but um, as I said, this is really preparing us for something that's very tempting to do uh, in relativity. What about the distance between J and K, Mary's lines? Okay. Well, now the correct answer is to use Q and these points A and C. The magnitude of the separation between A and C. That's correct for Mary, um, and that's correct for these lines because they are Mary's lines. 
we just define the distance between two lines as the perpendicular, the length of a perpendicular segment. This is again a 30, 60, 90 triangle, um, but now the 100 meters is the hypotenuse of this guy, and this is the long side. And so that's going to be 100 root 3 over 2. Um, which is about 86.6 meters. What about an incorrect answer? Well, if John were really wedded to his system, he's like, hey, I measured my length between, my distance between lines L and M to be 100 meters. P was exactly the right kind of line to measure a segment on for that me measurement. Why can't I just merit measure the distance between Mary's lines in the same way? A and B are on lines J and K, respectively. And so it's a distance between two points on Mary's lines. Why isn't it 100 meters? Well, that's wrong, of course, because it's not perpendicular to J and K. Okay. So we have the situation where if we believe John in everything, we might tempted, be tempted to believe for a second that lines L and M and lines J and K have the same distance with e from each other because they share these two points that are on, this is on J and, and L, and this is on M and K. But that's not right. It's the right way to measure the distance between John's lines, but it's a terrible way to measure the distance between Mary's lines because this isn't perpendicular to Mary's lines. Mary's lines are actually rather close, rather closer together than John's lines are, but it's this slant that makes them actually able to have these points in common. Okay, So that's the Euclidean version of the train problem. And uh, yeah, it's a little weird. We know how to measure the distance between two lines. We're not foolish enough to make those mistakes. But let's see how that work plays out in the, um, the relativistic situation.